In our discussion of applied systems, we will introduce what an applied system is, describe heat pumps and heat recovery chillers, explore air source and water source products, dive into applications, and end with potential sources and sinks. When we talk about applied systems, we assume that the system contains a centralized chilled water generator, typically a chiller, and a centralized hot water generator, typically a gas-fired boiler. Pumps move the water from the centralized plant through a network of pipes and to the terminal units, often coils. The coils then transfer their energy to the space being conditioned. The water then enters the return line and is pumped back to the central plant. In the coming discussion of electrifying systems using heat pumps and heat recovery, we will look at what these products are and then at several ways to use them to help reduce or eliminate the need for the gas-fired boiler. First, let's talk about a few definitions and create an understanding for terminology when we are talking about heat pumps and heat recovery chillers in applied systems. So what is a heat pump? Heat recovery chiller, chiller heater, and a heater. The names may sound interchangeable, but there are some notable differences when it comes to equipment technology. Let's look at heat pumps. The term heat pump is often used in our industry to describe any unit that is used to provide heat. While this is a common term, we can better define this as there are different types of equipment choices that can be made using this technology. In simple terms, a heat pump is a unit that contains a reversing valve in the refrigeration circuiting, which allows the evaporator and condenser to switch roles. So when we look at heat pump heat exchangers, we use the terms source, and sink instead of evaporator and condenser to describe where we are either absorbing energy from or rejecting energy to. Because of the switching of modes, these units can be considered reversible. Heat pumps can come in a wide range of sizes and are available in water source and air source versions. In this slide, we are illustrating a heat pump operating in cooling mode. This operation is just like a chiller producing cold water for a cooling load and rejecting the heat absorbed to a sink. Shown here is an example of a heat pump rejecting heat to the ambient air. This now shows the heat pump operating in heating mode. The reversing valve has now changed positions and the source and sink have switched. We are now pulling heat out of the source and providing heat for the load. Now the heat pump is absorbing heat from the ambient air. Ideal applications would be buildings that cool in the summer and heat in the winter, like a school for example, or a multi-use high-rise that has to heat during a cool morning and provide cooling as the day warms. Now that we understand what a heat pump is, let's take a look at heat recovery chillers and heaters. A heat recovery chiller is simply a chiller that is recovering some or all of the heat of rejection to be used for heating purposes. Unlike a heat pump, where the purpose is only to heat or to cool, a heat recovery chiller is used to provide both heating and cooling simultaneously. The primary application of a heat recovery chiller is cooling and recovering heat as a byproduct. Common heating uses would include, but not be limited to, comfort heating, laundry, showers, pool heat, and sterilization. The piping layout shown here will be considered preferentially loaded. This means that the heat recovery chiller needs to make the system chilled water temperature because it is sending it directly to the load. In this case, we get what we can get out of the condenser side for heat. Heat recovery chillers can come in numerous sizes, configurations, and compressor technologies. In these examples, we are focusing on water-cooled heat recovery chillers. Next is the heater. A heater is the same machine as a heat recovery chiller, but is applied with heating being its primary function and chilled water is the useful byproduct. Here we see the heater piped in a side car arrangement. These units would control to a heating water set point and get what they get on the chilled water side as the cold water is being sent to the return of the main chiller plant. Common uses would be the same or similar as heat recovery, but the load would dictate which application would be appropriate. Our last water source unit is the chiller heater. Again, these units are the same as a heat recovery chiller, 
or a heater, but are applied and controlled in a different fashion. The chiller heater can be controlled to provide heating or cooling as a primary function. Again, these units do not contain a reversing valve. The control function is dependent on the application need at a particular point in time. With some basic terminology covered, we can now look at some products and how we can use them in an applied system. First, we will start off with air source products. Pictured here is an air source heat pump. As the arrows illustrate, one can see the unit uses the ambient air to absorb heat and input that heat into the load water. Pictured on the left would be typical operation in the heating mode. Because this is a heat pump and contains a reversing valve in its refrigeration circuit, it can also reverse modes of operation and provide cooling by rejecting heat to the ambient air. Pictured on the right. The construction and design of an air source heat pump is very similar to that of an air-cooled chiller. Pictured here are a few examples. With our understanding of heat pump terminology, we can describe a few major components. The air coil would be considered a source or sink depending on the mode of operation. In the heating mode, the air coil is absorbing heat to be put into the load water. While in cooling mode, the air coil is a sink that is rejecting heat like a chiller and producing chilled water for the load. Variable speed fans then maintain the required operating pressures similar to condenser fans. The controls of a heat pump are again similar to that of a chiller, except the operator can select heating or cooling mode. Air source heat pumps can be found in many size ranges and configurations. So how does the energy contained in the ambient air get transferred to the load water? Pictured here is a generic refrigeration circuit for an air sourced unit. Ambient air is pulled across the face of the outdoor coil where the energy contained in it is absorbed into the refrigeration circuit. The compressor then adds heat and pressure to the refrigerant. And finally, this heat is transferred to the water in the heat exchanger and pumped to the load. Air source heat pumps can come in packaged or modular configurations. So why choose one over the other? Let's look at some features of both. Packaged heat pumps come in a wide range of nominal sizes and configurations. Mostly utilizing scroll compressors, smaller units are typically a single circuit where larger units feature dual refrigerant circuiting. Packaged units can be advantageous for larger projects as they can be lower cost at larger tonnages. These units can offer options like low sound fans and pump packages to accommodate site requirements. Modular units are another option as well. Modular heat pumps can offer flexible sizing and footprint configurations, typically offered in nominal tonnages from 10 to 80 tons per module. When redundancy is required, modular units can provide an easy way to accommodate this as they feature multiple independent circuits or additional modules can be included in the array. Because they use multiple units linked together, they can be a good solution for variable flow systems. Options like pump packages and glycol systems can easily be incorporated into a modular chiller assembly. Now we can take a look at a few ways to apply air source heat pumps in an applied system. Our first application example looks at using an air source heat pump to supplement or offload a boiler load. In this system, you can see we simply install the heat pump on the return side of the heating load and preheat the water returning to the boiler reducing or eliminating the boiler. This is a simple way to electrify a heating system. This application is typically referred to as preheating because the heat pump may not be able to make the higher temperature water needed off of the boiler for the heating system. For example, if the heating system needs 160 degree hot water, an air source heat pump may only supplement this temperature as the current maximum heating temperatures today are in the range of 130 to 150 degrees. For this reason, it is important to understand the heating system supply and return temperatures and verify the heat pump can operate at the conditions we are designing to. The next application we will look at is a water source heat pump system. This system would typically include a cooling tower to reject excess heat and a boiler to provide needed heat both designed to keep the water source heat pump loop within the operational range of the water source heat pumps. 
A simple way to electrify the system would be to remove the boiler and install an air source heat pump to take care of the heating needs, formerly done with the boiler. Another benefit of this application is that the heat pump could also provide some redundancy or backup. Let's say the cooling tower goes down or is in poor shape. The heat pump could be operated in cooling mode to make up for this condition. Incorporating this heat pump would typically be as simple as connecting to the main loop as connections can be made almost anywhere in the piping system. Many water source heat pump loops are designed in the 60 to 90 degree range. Many air source heat pumps would be able to produce these temperatures down to around zero degrees. Below this ambient, additional heating sources could be required. Let's take a look at a new heating trend. Many new construction heating systems are going to lower temperature hot water requirements to suit the building needs. These temperatures can range from around 90 to 120 degrees, depending on the system design and building location. Many existing heating systems were designed in the 160 to 180 degree range. Lower heating temperatures are significantly more efficient than the higher temperatures of the past, allowing for higher system COPs. For heating systems with lower grade requirements, air source heat pumps can be a great design consideration for electrification. In these systems, an air source heat pump can be used as the sole heating source for the building. Of course, a boiler backup is always an option if needed. Many heat pumps are available today that can provide these lower heating temperatures at an ambient range down to zero degrees. With so many sizes available, as previously noted, there's quite a bit of flexibility when evaluating this potential system solution. When looking at an air source heat pump for the building needs, in addition to the ambient requirements, defrost mode, as Charlie covered earlier, has to be considered. Shifting gears now, we'll focus on water source heat pumps and heating chillers. Heat recovery chillers do not have a reversing valve and have the ability to control to a hot water temperature, as previously discussed. These units will be as small as a few nominal tons all the way to over a thousand tons. Our first water source application is heat recovery with a cooling load. In this system, we will have both heating and cooling loads. The chiller could control to either a cooling or a heating temperature. As previously discussed, this application or system would define the requirements for how we would be controlled and applied. So how does one size a heat recovery chiller? This process is quite straightforward. We can examine a load profile to determine what the sizing should be by finding out what the maximum coincidental load is. This graph is for an office building in Chicago. We have a peak load of about 600,000 BTUs and a peak heating load of about 200,000 BTUs. As the table shows, we can see the maximum simultaneous heating and cooling load is about 57,000 BTUs. We can then size our heat recovery chiller to match this load to recover as much energy as we can without oversizing the chiller. What if we need heat but don't have a cooling load but we do have a source. Our second application example is using a heater to provide heat, but we don't have a cooling need. In this application, we may look at using some other source available, examples to come. The intent is to only provide heat with the available source. 